Hello and welcome to Views from the Market, Mid-Market Private Equity and M&A in Canada. My name is Mario Negro, and I'm a partner in the Private Equity and M&A Group at Spike Minnelli. For today's podcast, I'd like to welcome our special guest, Matthew Burpee. Matthew is the Managing Director of Kepler Capital. Matthew, thank you for joining us and welcome. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to do this. You have a great story. I love your story. It's one of those stories that's not told enough in our marketplace, particularly in the middle market. So, of course, what an intro. I'm going to first start by asking our guests to tell us a little bit about themselves. So why don't we start there and then we'll talk about Kepler Capital. Sure. So as you said, I'm the managing director, Kepler Capital. I'm also the founder. We are a private equity fund that focuses on what we call the micro cap end of the market. So for us, that's half a million to three million of EBITDA. We buy majority ownership of businesses across North America. And we've been doing this since the end of 2018, December 2018 to be exact. We've got seven companies in our group today and a couple more that we're working on. It's been a good road. It's been a fun road to get here. Before Kepler, I spent about five years working for another Canadian private equity fund, one that was much more established than we are, and learned the ropes that way. Also spent some time with a couple different entrepreneurial ventures, one of which was very successful and one of which was less so, and originally started my career as a CA, an accountant with one of the big accounting firms. So I come at this from a fairly analytical and quantitative lens, but private equity has given me a chance to play the role of operator a little bit more as well. Matthew Kepler is such a great story. What I find most interesting, and I know we're going to get into the nitty gritty of it, is you decided to start this fund. You worked on the street. You had multiple roles in private equity and working with private capital. Why the micro space? What was it about this space? Because I know I remember when you were out there in the early days trying to build this thing out and look, went through a bunch of obstacles. People didn't understand the space, but you believed in it right from the beginning. So I want to get your sense of why this space. Yeah, it's an interesting question because I think the reasoning has changed a little bit over the years. When we first launched the fund, the premise was filling a need in an underserved market. We're buying companies that are a little bit too big for most individuals or most employees and a little bit too small for your traditional lower mid-market private equity fund. And so as a result, you can buy high quality businesses for very reasonable purchase prices. And as a result, you can generate returns just through profitability and cash flow alone. You don't need to rely on selling for a higher price to the next person. I think that's still true, but the growth of search funds has really changed the dynamic of the market. And as a result, our size deal is very attainable for an individual buyer with the right skill set and mentality. But what's still true today is that we're buying businesses that are big enough that they have some real infrastructure and systems and processes. They're not a mom and pop shop. There's a real business there, but still small enough that there are low hanging fruit growth opportunities so that we can buy a business and grow it at a comfortable pace over the long term, which is ultimately what we're trying to do. I remember when you were out there in the early days selling Kepler Capital and the vision that you had. Now, obviously, like any private equity fund, it's not easy raising money. It's tough. One hopes it's getting easier, but I still think it's a struggle, but it, and even more so for the micro cap kind of lower middle market space. But one of the great elements of Kepler is you were able to succeed in raising that capital. May you talk a bit about the fundraising process? Because it's a great start for our marketplace. And as much as I know you don't want me to say this, we want more Keplers. Uh, you so, know, I'm fine with competition. I think the market's <laughs> big enough for a few more. I'm proud to say that just last fall, we raised our second fund. But fund one fundraising was the hardest thing I've ever had to do professionally. It was really grueling. And that came as a bit of a surprise. I thought it would be easier than it was. And raising a blind pool fund as a first time fund for a relatively less appreciated end of the market is really tough. It took all in all from start to finish about nine months to do took us about six months to get to our first close. We did a first close with $10 million of committed capital and then a final close with 15. And I remember at one point sitting down and just going through my LinkedIn profile and saying, who do I know who has money or might know people with money? And I literally called in every chit, called in every favor that I had to get the money together. What changed was finding one anchor investor who believed the story and was willing to take a bet on us, on me. And I got a little bit lucky. It was a family office in Toronto. 
a group that I have tremendous amount of respect and appreciation for. I caught them at a great point where the patriarch of the family had just sold his business and had a fair bit of money ready to deploy, burning a hole in his bank account. But I also think that I told the story well and they believed in it. Once that first anchor came on board, it really got the ball rolling and allowed us to get the rest of the fund closed. I remember those days. I will second that you were everywhere. You were under every rock in every corner trying to raise capital and congratulations on closing that first fund in the second fund. The other part that's interesting is when you talk about traditional private equity, we always talk about the model based on a whole period and, you know, maximizing whether it's four or five, six, seven years. You've not only bought these companies and focused on growth, but you're not necessarily tied to the traditional private equity model of these companies. You're growing them and keeping them. And I want to get your thoughts behind that, you know, that part of your thesis. Yeah, I will clarify by saying that we're not strictly a buy and hold firm, but our mentality is we want to buy companies with a long term view and we want to earn our returns through the existing cash flows of the business and growing those cash flows. That doesn't mean that we won't sell doesn't mean that we would never sell. It just means that we don't want to be forced to sell. We want to sell because somebody comes along with a crazy offer and not because we need to do it to hit our return thresholds. And I think that's a bit of a unique twist on the private equity model. Certainly, we're not the only ones with that approach, but we're in the minority. And you know, my view on it is it's really hard to find high quality businesses that are a good fit, especially in our end of the market. And we work really hard to find them. And we look at a lot of deals. And why would I sell if I have a business that's performing well, that's growing, that is hitting all the characteristics that we ultimately look for, and it's providing us quarterly cash flows and distributions. Ultimately, that's the dream. Why would I go and sell it just to have to start all over again? And that's really how we view the market. You know, underlying what you just said is the nature of these businesses. And I know you and I come from the same roots on this one is I sometimes think people don't appreciate the M&A opportunities that exist and the quality of the companies that are in kind of micro cap and lower and middle market space. And I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about the kind of companies you have in your portfolio, the kind of companies you look for. What's your sweet spot when it comes to the type of companies you look for? When we look at a business and frequently when someone on our team is pitching a deal to me, I ask them the question, if this business is so great, why is it so small? And we've learned over the years that there's a lot of bad answers. A bad answer would be a business that's overly reliant on a single customer, an owner who has not done a good job delegating or building a team, or a business that doesn't really have a great product and therefore doesn't have a lot of demand. But there are also some really good answers. An example of a good answer would be, we are the dominant player within this obscure niche in the market, but it's not that big a market. Or, you know, we're the dominant player in a specific geographic region, but it's not that big a region. We have a company in Edmonton. It's a software company that provides a couple different software tools, an analysis tool and a form management tool to K-12 schools across Alberta. And their software is used in 90% of the schools in the province. And so they are an exceptional business. Their customer base has a huge appreciation for their products. But when you're only focused on a single province and your products are highly customized to that region, there's a limit to how big you can get. And for us, that's the sweet spot because we found a business that is defensible, that has solid revenues, a solid brand name, a solid product, and they just need someone like us to come in and help them figure out how do we take what we've done really well in this region and expand it somewhere else. Want to drill down a little bit about the deal making process for Kepler in terms of the businesses you have in their portfolio. What sectors do you look for and where do you look for deals? I mean, sometimes people don't appreciate how hard it is to find deals in the lower middle. Sell side advisors often won't even take on some of these mandates. You really got to get behind the advisors in some ways. I mean, this is really a space where proprietary searching has led to great success for you, for the search funds, for the independent sponsors. You've had a great success at finding some of these companies. How do you do it? What do you look for in terms of the deal making process? Our strategy has changed and adapted over the years. Now I can say that 100% or maybe 99% of our efforts are focused on deals that are in market and have some sort of representation, a broker or an investment bank, et cetera. We've tried proprietary deal sourcing in the past. And what I've found is that it takes a lot of effort just to qualify the lead, to figure out, are you talking to someone who's ready to sell? Are they in your EBITDA range, et cetera? And if I was buying one company, like a search fund, 
I think that's a good use of time because you can get some really neat deals. You can uncover some really neat companies, but we need to do two, three, four deals a year in order for our economics to make sense. And so we need to know when we put some time into something that we're talking to a seller who's ready to sell. And so all the deals we look at are represented by some sort of advisor. And the key for us has been getting our name out to the literally thousands of sell side advisors across North America. Fortunately for me, I've been in this end of the market for almost 10 years now. And so a lot of the more well-known advisors know me by name, know Kepler by name. But beyond that, we do a lot of outreach efforts on our own, trying to figure out which mid-market investment bank is now dipping down into our size range. Let's get in front of them. Let's talk to the different people on their team. Let's send them quarterly updates so that we're top of mind for them. And ultimately, we want to make sure that if there's a deal in our range in North America, we want to see it. And we're far from perfect, but I think we're ahead of most in that category. And when you're out there deal hunting it, you know, in terms of spaces that you look for, sectors, are there any, anything you particularly you keep your eyes on, anything you kind of stay away from? Yes. We look for businesses that are essential and non-cyclical. And so our view is that we're constantly preparing for the next recession. We won't necessarily buy businesses that will be completely insulated from a recession, but we want to be insulated on a relative basis. We will drop less than other comparable competitors and less than other industries if the economy slips. And so that tends to drive us towards B2B software, B2B services, healthcare, and manufacturing. And it pushes us away from the more cyclical industries such as construction, retail, direct-to-consumer, e-commerce, energy mining. Ultimately, some of this is selfish. I just like to sleep well at night and I like to keep my blood pressure low. And so I want businesses where every month when they send me results, I know within plus or minus 10 or 20%, I know what the numbers are going to look like. That helps my stress level and it's a big part of what we look for. You, you closed Fund 2. What was the size of Fund 2? 26 million. So you're going to get out there and do even more than you did last time. And here we are That's in right. this kind of weird market that we're in. But what I notice, at least in the lower middle market and the micro cap, is the deal flow is still strong. We're still seeing a lot of sellers, still seeing a lot of banks lending, a lot of capital providers. What are you seeing out there on your end in terms of the market today, opportunities, deal flow, getting stuff done? How busy are you? If you're busy, I'm busy. So I always ask, how busy are you? you know? Right now, specifically, I would say very. We have two deals under LOI that will hopefully be the first two in the new fund. But I will say that there was a good chunk of late last year where there was a bit of a lull. I think there was some price discovery happening on both the buyer and seller side. And I think there still is. But we're starting to see, I guess, a bit of a compromise where sellers are saying, OK, it's not the frothy 2021 valuation multiples anymore. But they're also saying, hey, you buyers, we're not responsible for the interest rates going up. You've got to meet us halfway. You can't put all of that onto our valuation. And so I think buyers have come up a little. I think sellers have come down a little. And we're starting to see some deals happen. But all that said, in the last six to nine months, I have had more broken deals than the rest of my career combined. And situations where we were the top bidder, but the seller just decided not to sell because we couldn't hit the price they were looking for. So I think the market is still in a weird place, but for sure there's deals happening and it's our job to find them. And you and I both believe in this space and think the opportunity is strong. I mean, when you look at where the market is for these type of deals, where the market's going, I mean, obviously you're a believer. You did fun too for a reason. <laughs> and clearly, you know, people believe in you because, you know, congratulations again on the success of not only fun one, but the fundraise. So where do you see this market going, particularly when it comes to this space? There are a lot of high quality businesses in the smaller end of the market. They might be harder to find. They might be a little more rare, but there's also just way more businesses, period, in this size range. So I think the broader private equity world is starting to realize that. And we're starting to see some larger funds dip down into our size range, whether it's for add-ons or for smaller platform companies. And I think that's going to continue. I also think the search fund model is really a game changer for the industry. And I think it's a net positive. In some ways, they compete with us. And in some ways, it's a bit of a different offering from what we do. So it's friendly competition in that respect. And I think those trends are just going to continue for the long term. Ultimately, there's tens of thousands of business owners that are going to be selling in the next couple of years. There need to be buyers. That's just a fact. 
Matthew, I want to thank you for joining us. It's been great to have you here to tell us about the Kepler Capital story and the success of Kepler Capital. And I want you to be more successful. So keep going and do what you're doing because it's a great story for this space and it's a great story for our marketplace. So thank you for coming on our podcast and for telling the Kepler story. Thanks for having me, Mario.